Okay, come on back. We're going to talk about policy now, switch to policy. And we have amazing policy experience on our panel. So uh, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to just present a little bit of my own research that it just um, builds on, um, on the last panel that showed you know, the increasing numbers of papers, the increasing citations to teams, and so on. But I just want to show one aspect of it that I came, uh, came at, trying to look at the whole, uh, maybe let's say the whole history of um, publication as it relates back to public policy. All right. Hi. There you are. Okay, and I'll introduce our panel in a minute. So I did a, a paper. It's called um, "The Price of Big Science." Price being um, Derek De Sola Price. And in 1960, as people know in this field, Price uh, projected that um, scientific publication couldn't possibly keep growing at an exponential rate. Right? Um, he was a physicist. He knew that no. Uh, system can ever grow at an exponential rate. Um, and so as a result, he said, well, obviously what's going to have to happen is scientific publication is going to level off. And so here was 1960, and he said, over time, um, we're going to have a saturation level in publications, and uh, scientific publications is going to have to level off. And because also the number of scientists can't continue to grow, otherwise everyone would be a scientist. That's what he said. And so this was his graph in 1960. And so I'm going to say, oh, let's say about 30 years. And so I looked at that data, and I said, OK, what's happening? And then, as we know from the prior panel, scientific publication has continued to grow at an exponential rate. So um, what does that do to prices, um, prices theory here? So if you actually look at the growth of um, scientific publication from 1700, when we might say um, modern science began, what we can see is that um, we have the hockey stick, the famous hockey stick of exponential growth. You can see uh, the numbers of papers. This was in Web of Science, and we know that's only a percentage of all the papers done. And so it shows you um, the uh, predicted trend here of continuing to grow. All right. So what we did is we built a model. Hold on. How do you go ahead? There we go. So we did. We built a model. And I wanted to show you my model, um, which is a flow and stock diagram. And we did a number of things that people did on the last panel. We assumed a level of obsolescence. We measured that. We measured the extent of growth and carrying capacity of the system and the, the growth of the system and so on. And, and it's all, this is all in the paper. The paper is in the journal Policy and Complex Systems, um, Stock and Flow Model. And we talked about the average lifetime, which um, Santo talked about as, as shortening. Um, and so what we found um, when we actually counted papers, what happened? When we counted papers, uh, bop, 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 bop. when we counted papers, um, what we found is that unlike Price's expectation in 1960, that uh, exponential growth would level off into saturation, that what it does, the actual numbers continue on the exponential growth curve that Price originally uh, showed in his, um, in his data. So um, as we know from our high school physics class, uh, and following, again, Price's intuition, uh, that no system can grow exponentially um, or, uh, con at a continuous rate, right? So, um, but what happens to a system that continues to grow exponentially? Um, it phase shifts. And I suggest to you that what has happened in around the year 1990, between 1990 and 1995, is we've had a systemic phase shift, and we've shifted from a, uh, an era of scarcity to an era of abundance. So the abundant system now has a huge amount of papers, but we also have new ways to access the papers and share the papers. And I suggest to you this is why we're seeing the rise of the open access movement um, and why we're also seeing um, the rise of teams. Uh, now, the reason that this is important is because it has significant policy implications. Um, the policy implication is um, that we're sh as we shift from a system of scarcity, where you had to go to the Harvard Library to get a paper, let's say, 
um, in the 1940s, right? Well, now you can Google the paper online through Google Scholar. It's able to be accessed in many different places um, and easily, um, uh, easily accessed, and more, let's say, more easily accessed. I know some people in developing countries feel they're still not giving full, given full access, but what we do know is that abundant systems operate by different sets of rules and probabilities than scarce systems. Okay, and so if we approached science policy from a position that we are now in a system where the rules, the underlying rules of exchange, of sharing, of funding um, are really significantly different, then that has real implications for science policy and how we think about governing the system. And I have a book coming out on that um, called Globally Networked Science, and um, you can uh, consult my book after it's out. Um, anyway, so that's what I'd like to challenge our panel with, if um, you agree. Abundance equals shifts in public policy. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is introduce our panel. Um, and of course, I would say most of these folks are really well known. Um, Kevin Finneran, who I'm, whom I'm sure you know is the editor of Issues in Science and Technology for many years. Longtime Washingtonian. Same with uh, William Bal Valdez, who was um, head guru at Department of Energy and one of the founding fathers of um, Science of Science Policy, sitting next to Kay Husband's Feeling, who is now the chair of Science and Technology Policy at Georgia Tech, but also a founding mother of science and public policy, um, especially at the National Science Foundation, where she uh, initiated the program on the science of science policy. So we have a fantastic group. And they each want to take 15 minutes, um, but we also want to make sure we have plenty of time to discuss. So what I'm going to do is keep you right to your time. Um, and uh, who wants to go first? Bill. All right. Do you want the mic or you? No. Okay. And how do I get to presentation? So this is going to be much different than anything you've heard before at this workshop. Um, the, uh, I come at this as from the perspective of somebody who actually managed a science policy shop and managed science programs um, and spent budget, managed the research portfolio, and uh, had the privilege of uh, engaging with Dr. Jack Marburger uh, when he first initiated the Science of Science Policy Initiative. And if you go back to his original vision, uh, he asked two simple questions when I first talked to him. He said, if I had $10 of extra budget, how much should I give to biology, physics, chemistry? So basically a resource allocation question. And then the second was, how do I explain that decision to the president, right? I remember his president was George W. Bush, the MBA president. And for those of you long-term Washingtonians, uh, you'll recall that George W. came in and said, I am going to measure things. I am going to force agencies to explain how they spend money. And so, uh, you know, those of us who are here, we had to deal with GIPRA, the Government Performance Results Act, and the Program Assessment Rating Tool. Uh, how many of you remember that? You know, so uh, my job in the bureaucracy was to actually uh, meet the GIPRA and PART requirements, okay? So Jack was faced with a difficult operating environment. Um, it was right after 9-11, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and a focus on terrorism, and climate skepticism within the Bush administration. And so when he would go into meetings with the president, you know, he'd be asked questions, you know, why should I spend another dime on physics if I can't justify it? You know, if you can't tell me why I should do that, I'm having to go after Osama bin Laden. I'm having to fight a war on terrorism. I'm having to deal with DHS and the creation of that monstrosity. So help me out here. And then aren't scientists the ones that, you know, tell me that the climate is changing? And I don't believe that, okay? 
So he wanted, Jack, wanted help from social and economic sciences to create a supplement for expert judgment. Now keep in mind, Jack was a world-class physicist, and he was able to use expert judgment in ways that all of us are familiar with. And the scientific community, you know, through peer review, big committees, you know, national academy committees, external review, all that sort of stuff, relies upon expert judgment when it comes to policy decisions. But he had a president who was saying, no, I want data-driven decisions, okay? So data decision, uh, data-driven decisions requires data-driven decision support tools to answer that how much question. And then data-driven resource allocation justifications, the why, are also require new tools to develop. <coughs> so we've been talking a lot in this workshop about models. And as you can see, agencies already use models as core decision support tools, okay? You talked about climate change, all the rest, okay? So what's the problem that we're trying to solve here. Any guess? What's the problem? Actually, it goes back to this. The data-driven resource allocation justification question is answered by all of these models, okay? I can explain my budget, I can explain my you know, policy decision through the use of the models that you guys have talked about here but I cannot give data-driven resource allocation decisions, okay? I haven't heard a single model at this workshop that would enable me to make data-driven resource allocation decisions, okay? So that's what's gonna be the focus of my discussion. There's a real resistance to the use of models and decision support tools for internal agency processes. Jack was on the right track, but the only problem was that he was attacking a subset of a larger problem. How many federal bureaucrats out there? You know? How many times in a budget meeting have you heard a discussion about patent citations? You know? The fact of the matter is, the federal government is the world's largest, most complex organization in the world but continues to use outdated decision support tools for all of its business processes. So Jack was focused on R&D, but the reality is this is true for the federal government as a whole, which is why I have my new book up here, uh, The Handbook of Federal Government Leadership and Administration, which is coming out in the fall and takes a look at how the federal government is led and administered. And for you social scientists out there, this is a whole new area of study that you should be focusing on. Because federal R&D funding is only about $140 billion and it comes from 17 agencies. But the federal government is a $3.8 trillion budget, 2.8 million employees, 17 million contract employees, 1,400 business units. There is no comparable organization in the world. What our book is talking about is, is what is the theory that underpins leadership and administration for the federal government? Does anybody have a clue? There is none. There is none. You have the world's largest organization, the most complex organization, one of the oldest organizations, and there is no theory, no systems level model that helps explain leadership and decisions that come out of that entity. And it touches the lives of every American citizen. And yet, it remains one of the most poorly understood organizations in the, in the world. So, what are you know, the implications of this? So, all of these functional areas that I have up here are guided by expert judgment within the federal government budget formulation, execution, workforce analyses, resource allocation decisions. I mean, think about it in your own context, in your own university, right? Uh, you don't use models and support, decision support tools for those kind of processes. 
but you should be using them if you're managing a modern organization. But what drives, what really drives policymakers? There are three primary drivers. First is the budget, and these are in order, by the way. <laughs> these are in order. You know, I used to say when I was still a federal bureaucrat, uh, which ended two years ago uh, when I retired, that the number one job of a federal bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. is to get budget for their programs. That's it. You know, forget everything else. Uh, annual budget cycle dominates planning and decision making in the bureaucracy. Okay? Second main driver, proximity to power. Politicals by law, are the ultimate decision makers. There are 3,000 political appointees in the federal government, 2.8 million federal employees. Those 3,000 political appointees make the policy, budget, program decisions. They decide what the budget is. So the closer you are to power, the closer you are to making policy. And then the third thing is mission accomplishment. Congressmen and the president determine and guide agency missions. The bureaucracy doesn't. It's Congress and the president. So these are what are the policy drive makers. You know, this is what drives policy makers. Okay? So how would models help? Resource allocation decisions defense, promotion of agency missions, and crisis management. We've heard a little bit about it, some of these things. But currently, all of these areas are affected, or decided in a highly fragmented system uh, through expert judgment. Systems thinking is rarely a part of the decision-making process. So what's needed? Jack's vision of a data-driven decision support tool era will come to fruition if, I love Dan Moat's views on culture taking hold, you know, cultural accelerants and barriers. Sandy Petland's innovative uses of big data can drive policy budget decisions. I've heard a lot of snippets and pieces of things that lead me to believe that we could use what you produce as modelers within you know, the framework that I, I used to operate in, uh, but doesn't currently occur, okay? So I became the director of the planning shop in, at DOE in 1999, yeah. And I had the great good fortune of having a $1 million budget that I could use for whatever I wanted with that office. And so what I decided to do was to create a research effort that was focused on meeting the requirements of GIPRA in part and developing decision support tools that would enable my leadership to make better decisions, okay? And our vision was a third generation system going from Excel spreadsheets to what we could get from disaggregated data, you know, through data mining and, you know, all these pretty pictures that you see, into something that brought it all together, okay? Um, and I hired some really top quality, <laughs> I hired some really top quality researchers, like Jerry Glenn, like Caroline Wagner, okay? Uh, and what our basic thrust was, merging analysis with data. Okay, everything you've heard today, going from expert judgment, case studies, to data-driven analysis. Okay, so we started with data, and we started with our own researchers. We used a tool called Spire to look at, you know, who were the researchers within our system. We then did a portfolio level view of, of, of our portfolio uh, using Spire. Then we did the benchmarking. We looked at DOE and NSF and you know, where we had combined portfolios, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we developed tools to help us analyze that kind of information. So we had a patent analysis tool uh, that is still in use today at the DOE uh, that looked at you know, where our patents were going and that sort of thing. 
Uh, we did some basic citation analysis um, and then developed, you know, a knowledge amplification effect. Um, we could use this, you know, during uh, budget justification, that, that kind of thing. Um, we told stories like the traces story that Jim was talking about earlier at NIH. Um, we came up with some innovative ways to look at patents and, you know, for example, we created the concept of technology hotspots and then we compared our performance to other agencies. Uh, obviously a very nice way to, when we're in the budget wars, to be able to justify our budget. Um, and then we took successor patents and, you know, again, compared it across agencies. We used this in internal discussions with OMB when we were trying to justify our budget. We were at the time looking at a doubling of the budget for basic research at the Department of Energy. And statistics like this helped us make the case for that. We then looked at, you know, the uh, uh, effect of our patents on university research and our DOE support. And this particular uh, slide was used in a uh, uh, response to a GAO inquiry on the level of multidisciplinary research that we were doing at the Department of Energy. Okay? Uh, this particular slide uh, led to the creation of a study that Caroline headed up with Sue Mormon at the University of Southern California that looked at the emergence of nanoscience, and then we used that as a basis, you know, pre-literature review for the nanoscience networking study that uh, Caroline did at, uh, for the five nano centers that we created at the Department of Energy in the mid-2000s, okay? So very practical applications of this kind of data and this kind of approach. And then we said, well, wait a minute, we need to put all this together, you know, because we really need to have an approach that develops, that creates uh, something useful for senior management. So we looked around at different modeling techniques and we decided that system dynamics modeling really was the way to go, okay? And so we created a system dynamics <laughs> model for key components of our uh, portfolio looking at big facilities, researcher demographics, and we created an S&E workforce model, but we also created a budget model, uh, other things that we could use to, you know, during budget justification. So, only have a couple minutes left, but did anybody notice anything about this slide, this slide, this slide, all the other slides that I've just recently shown you? Look at the bottom, 2004. This is the presentation that I gave to Dr. Marburger when he called me into his office in 2005 and asked me how we could help develop the science of science policy. Everything you've seen here is pre-2005. So we're not cutting any new ground here. You know, it's just a matter of what is causing us to not actually implement Dr. Marburger's vision. So what are the barriers to the use of models for decision support? There's an absence of funding. I mentioned that I had a science policy operation with a million dollar budget that I could use for research. At the time, I was the only major agency science policy shop that had that kind of flexibility. A lack, and it's still probably true, you know, very close to true. Lack of career staff expertise with models, complexity of use of the models, short attention span of political leadership. They're only in office for two years. You know, they don't want to see any big studies. They just want the bottom line. Institutional inertia, you know, it's been, the federal government's been around for a long time. You know, hate to change their processes. A fear of transparency. And then the big kahuna, a deep distrust of social economic sciences. Do not underestimate the impact of the deep trust, deep distrust, okay? Physical phenomenon can be measured against objective criteria. 
And those theories have been developed over millennia. You know, go back to the Greeks. You know, they were making observations of astronomy and mathematics and, you know, physics. Organizational human behavior has only been studied for two centuries. So it's the difference between weather forecasting and psychology, physics and economics, and seismology versus organizational dynamics. There's, in the bureaucracy, particularly among the scientific community, a big distrust of the models you're producing and whether they're reproducible, whether they actually have an impact on their business, okay? So until you overcome that barrier, thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from Kay Husband's Feeling, who, as you heard, spent some very valuable and important time here in Washington, D.C. She, in addition to uh, starting up the Science of Science Policy Program at National Science Foundation, she also worked here at um, the academies on a, an important study on metrics as well. Do you want to use the mic? I'm going to try to talk here. Um, just extemporaneously. Can you hear me? Or you have to use the mic, there. Okay, just so use I will use the mic. Um, so as, as I was just introduced, I'm Kay Husbands Feeling, Chair of the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech. Um, I am the person who in 2006 was asked, how do we write uh, a memo to the 12th floor of NSF to try to get funding for something that Jack Marburg wanted to see done? And, and I think Bill's um, his presentation is a perfect lead up to where I'm going to take this. Um, I was asked and I wrote this prospectus in 2006 with the help of a lot of folks at NSF that put in um, concepts and themes into this prospectus. And that launched CISIP and enabled us to, in 2007, put out a solicitation in, 2000, uh, in February, and then some of you in the room may have even been in the, in the first wave of funded um, scholars in, um, the, later on that year in 2007, and then continuing on. So um, I'm really excited to be here to look back and to look forward as well um, as we're challenged to think about this matchmaking, the CISIP PIs, the, sub, the CISIP um, principal investigators, and the call by policymakers for results. And I'm sort of calling this matchmaking. Um, let me uh, give my same picture. <laughs> we did not coordinate coordinate this. Um, and uh, this is Jet Marburger, who, with whom um, Julia Lane, who many of you know, and I, and um, uh, Stephanie Shipp uh, co-edited a book that Bill Valdez was also part of, and the Science of Science Policy Handbook. And in that process, we really got a sense of what he, Jack, as a policymaker, was calling for. And he writes, um, my policy speech is from 2005, actually going back to 2002, and thereafter expressed my frustration over the inadequacy of data and analytical tools commensurate with the science policymaking in a rapidly changing environment. So part of the, 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 tr the trick here is not only to develop these tools and to use data sets, but also to understand and, and change accordingly with what the demands are, are on these models and these tools. Um, he, he also went on to say, I'm not all, at all confident that the right questions are being asked or answered um, or, to provide guidance for action. And of course, policies are guides to action. So when I listen to, I've only been able to be here for a little bit. I flew up this morning. Um, and I heard the session before, and a lot of, uh, of reference to impact. My natural reference to impact is the impact of your scholarship on policymaking. So a lot of the reference was to the impact of a research product on other researchers, so impact factors and you know, uh, um, amplification of what a new idea is throughout the literature. But we're also to really trying to figure out what the impact is going forward. Um, 
Jack um, had a few other sayings that I wanted to put up here just to say, what do policymakers want? That's what this, the theme is of this session. Um, state and private sector resources should be com considered more systematically in formulating federal science policy. So a lot of the times also in our models, we focus on federal dollars, but it's also state and local dollars and private sector dollars in terms of innovation and entrepreneurship that also need to be considered. He calls for better benchmarks and the new science of science policy, this is back in um, 2007 when he wrote this, that would give us a surer foundation for setting priorities and better arguments for taking action, just as Bill um, outlined earlier um, as well. Um, so I, I'm kind of moving a little quickly because I think we started late and I know lunch is coming and we have another speaker. So I'm going to step through this part of it a little quickly. But this slide is summative. This is based on a few items. Um, working in the SISIP program, all right? Talking to policymakers during that time and figuring out what it is, are they, what are their questions. I also was on an academy's panel on science, technology, and innovation indicators, and it was a policy-driven study. Um, we published it in 2014, but the study started in 2011. Between 2011 and 14, a lot of what we did in that study um, was to try to, and Richard Freeman was on that panel, um, was try to figure out, you know, what do policymakers want in terms of these numbers and indicators um, to, to be able to construct policy. So taking a lot of this um, understanding from 2006 all the way to that 2014 period, this is what it's boiled down to. If you were to look in the uh, appendix actually to that report, there's scads, legions of questions that are there and they're all you know, categorized by the types of policies that, uh, that indicators can be connected to. But I've just boiled it down to these. Competitiveness is oftentimes at the top of the list. What may be the long-term effects of the US, um, in the US of the disappearance of big private sector research labs doing basic research? That sounds like a very basic question, but basically it's a question about competitiveness. And that is one of the, question that, the questions that comes up often. Data extraction and manipulation, a lot of what the, um, the, the scholars in this room work on, what are the emerging ways by which new data, metrics, and visualization analytics can or can be used to address science and technology policy questions. Again, that's one of, I didn't make that question up because I knew who, with whom I would be speaking today. That is precisely what the policymakers that we've talked to in those two different um, studies, that's one of the things they want to know. So they want to know what you know. Uh, geospatial clusters, Bill alluded to this. What are the regional and international hotspots for basic research and innovative activities? And, off, and, and a corollary to that, what are some of the, tr what is the trade, what are the trade flows? Um, north, 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 south, and south, south, right? In terms of how R&D um, services are traded. Um, innovation, under what circumstances can the public policy affect the speed of diffusion of new ideas. Oftentimes we're looking at R&D, research and development, and we're looking at innovation, so the commercialization of those new ideas. But oftentimes we fail to understand the diffusion of those ideas. And we had someone speak to us actually during the panel at the academies um, on metrics that can be used to look at diffusion of ideas, not just the creation um, and, and the ingenuity of new um, uh, of crea uh, creativity. Uh, role of government, what is, ex what is expected employment yield of public expenditure on S&T? The jobs question is critically important in many of these agencies. It's what uh, the, the president really wants to know. I mean, when we have put funding millions, billions, uh, millions of dollars into funding R&D, especially the research side, what is that employment, employment effect? That's important. Strategic policy design, what can be learned from the private sector on the efficacy of cross-functional teams? We heard presentations today on teams, and, and it's important not only to understand how teams work within the private sector or in small, in small companies, larger companies, but also in national labs, also in universities. 
in, in the labs, in laboratories and universities. That scholarship is critically important to answering this question. And again, the, this is the demand side. This is the side where policymakers are laying out what it is they want to know. Technology transfer, how, how can universities do more to transfer technology to the marketplace? Um, and the last, transformative research, how best to identify high impact multidisciplinary research opportunities that are underfunded. And so as, as um, Bill said earlier, oftentimes the funding question is critically important in the federal context, but we also know that there's some innovation and some innovative activities that don't receive the funding because the spotlight isn't there, but it could really lead to a takeoff in new, new areas of expertise. And how do we determine when to take that risk? Those are the types of models that we need. This is the demand side, and the folks sitting in this room um, can supply answers to those. So I said PIs meet the, the policymakers. We're matchmaking. So Tom Khalil has um, also weighed in on this, and Joel Shiraga as well. And I just want to go through a few of their comments about what they want to see. Um, for Khalil, back um, in earlier days when he was having conversations actually with Julia, when Julia Lane was um, the CISIP, um program officer at the time in the late aughts, um, talked about closer interaction between policymakers and academic researchers could have led to more productive outcomes. So one of the things that I wanted to give as an illustration, just the other day, just last Thursday at Georgia Tech, um, we had a meeting with the CDC. And the CDC put together a briefing book, a number of different, it was a huge room, 40 some people were in the room, let's say about half from CDC, half, a, a little less than half, so a little more than half from CDC, a little less than half from Georgia Tech. And each of the policy groups put together a, a, a brief on what are the questions they want answered. And each one ran around, and they gave us that information you know, well in advance. The researchers, we each picked one that we thought we could really address based on the scholarship that we have, including some of our graduate students. And they, at the table, would say what they really wanted, and we responded with what we could do. And it was like speed dating. That's what they called it. And it was a moderator, and she called it that, and we all called it that. But that was just a functional way of bringing this together. It's not high tech. It really isn't. Um, the modeling and the tools that are developed in the scholarship is very much leading edge high tech. But that connection with what do we want to know and how can we supply the answers to that, it was just that straightforward. And uh, some matches were made that day. Um, happy to say, and some would be made over time. And one of the, use, the utility of it was also that the policymakers in the room got to hear what others in different parts of the organization were working on. They don't talk to each other. So we're trying to solve problems and one-off problems when it could be really a collective because of the systems diagrams that we've just seen. So that was just an example that I wanted to give in, in, in one way to bridge, um, create this bridge, the bridge that Joel Shiraga mentioned, building a lasting bridge that will facilitate information exchange between social scientists, natural scientists, the private sector, and policymakers to yield better outcomes in a timely fashion. So Caroline, though she's a friend, she just gave me the three minute warning. Um, and so I am going to move through and just say a f just a few more words um, and not go through the whole thing that I had prepared. But what I have here are examples of CISIP PIs, as, so Erica Fuchs, Jason Owen Smith, and throughout this rest of the slide deck, and some of the work that they've done and how it really does go about addressing some of these problems that we want solved in the policy arena. Incentives and government governance structure to advance innovation. 
and they, you know, they work on work. Uh, uh, so Jason has some work on organizations and, um, you know, the, the confusion about rules influenced researchers to be more conservative in stem cell materials. Um, Jason also does some work on location of researchers and other facilities within a, um, just on the floor of your department, and how that kind of configuration does affect creativity. Um, I, I will, as, as I said, move forward. Um, I wanted to mention, now this isn't moving, okay. Tall Bear, she talks about uh, culture and how culture affects um, scientific inquiry. I wanted to mention this top bullet. Um, the creativity process is aided by analogy, but outcomes are not linear. Chris Shun does, so within the SciSit program, we did have economic, sociology, political science, um, some of the modelers that we hear, are here in the room, but we also funded some psychologists who did work on observing engineers as they're in the creative design process and trying to determine how that creativity evolves. That was really interesting work. I don't know how much we're funding that now, but very early on in the first round, Chris Shun got a, uh, an award to do that kind of work on creativity. Again, we usually look at research, we look at development, we rarely look at um, diffusion, and sometimes we, we, we're not really paying as much uh, um, attention either to the creative process. So this just goes through and talks about work and, and collaboration and the way in which decisive PIs are addressing certain issues. Um, slides will be available. And this gets to the data. Um, Lee Giles and Lee Fleming, they the guys, they um, have a, amazing types of data sets and it has really grown to the point where others in the room and Julia Lane and um, others have uh, developed, uh, Jason Owen Smith as well, have, have developed a data platform Platform called Iris, where uh, some very interesting ways in which they're using data to answer questions. The bottom bullet, experimental me methodology. Kathy Eckel is an economist, is an experimental economist, and trying to solve problems about um, energy efficiency by just actually doing a real live experiment using, you know, people in households and looking at how they they respond to incentives. And so that's another way in which we're solving these types of problems. So I'm gonna wrap up. I just wanna talk about a few ways forward. Um, one would be, and if NSF would let us have the data, but I'm not sure, um, is to mine broader impacts in awards and try to look at you know, are, what, what the PI says is a broader impact of their work, how is that executed? Are we getting those broader impacts and how can we facilitate that process? A second is to do, you know, sustainable bridge of communication and having dialogues like this would be important. Um, curating stories, we talked about stories and, and storytelling being very important for conveying the outcomes of your research in the policy context. And the last bullet I highlighted, because I really would love to see this happen, is something we talked about back in 2006 when SISEP was getting off the ground, was creating collaboratories. Those are virtual labs that solve problems, where, where people in these virtual labs solve problems, creating and funding collaboratories on science. And nowadays, the engineers at Georgia Tech are always talking about maker spaces. So I call mine a maker space for policy. Why not? Why not have the researchers that do what we do in this room and others that are SISIP type PIs and in our domains also engage with the policymakers and practitioners in this makerspace for policy and really engage in solving the problems that are critically important to our, our, our country and you know, globally. So that's another piece. I mean, just trying to answer that question, what um, should we do to bridge between the PIs and the research and the policy um, world. So that's it. Um, that's all I have for now, because Caroline is about to give me the hook, really. Um, and uh, we're going to be on to Kevin. Thanks so much, Kay.
And now, um, Kevin, do you have slides? Or? I have no slides, and okay. I will promise to be well under 15 minutes. All right. Um, Go. Um, on my job um, at the Academy, I, in addition to editing the magazine um, issues, which is meant to allow experts to speak directly to policymakers and other um, national business leaders and so on. I also run the Committee on Science, Engineering, and Public Policy, which is the overarching policy committee for the academies. And its job is to bring the opinion, if not the science community, at least of the elite science community, to policymakers and leaders in government. And, um, and I have to say that, that it, it's, in many ways, it's stimulating and a pleasure to spend a couple of days in a room with all of you far left brain types um, who are doing wonderfully creative, rigorous, scrupulous work to, to mine data, to use it effectively, to identify good data, and to present it. And I think that um, my little bit of advice is to just think very carefully about which audiences you're preparing data for and how you present it. And I think that there are very receptive audiences for a lot of this. Um, one of the early users of supercomputing super in the United States was Walmart. Even be before we bought things online, we used to go to stores. And Walmart used supercomputers, and they would analyze every sale, every transaction in every store in the country every night. And then they would restock the shelves based on what they learned from that interaction to put things at the right level and the right place related to other products in order to get sales. Of course, online um, retailers now do this every time you do a search, an ad pops up based on what you search for. If you look for hiking trails, the next thing you know, there are hiking boots being advertised when you do your next search. So I think that there is, in business, there's a tremendous market for this. And I think you've seen it. And we've seen good examples of how people, because they measure things. They're measuring returns. They know about sales. They re appreciate data. And the data, the bottom line, matters a great deal to them. I think also that that there is a, a terrific market in government for people who are implementing programs. So I think we heard Sandy Pentland talk about redesigning bus routes based on where people live, where they had to go, and so on. I mean, there are many people in government who have to make practical decisions, and they need good, reliable data to guide those decisions. Um, we also see it in, um, in people like in epidemiology. I mean, we know public health people can use this data, and they are using it very effectively. And they're prepared to try to use it you know, as the Zika emerges. They are using models of how Ebola and other viruses spread and what, how the, what the differences between an insect-borne versus a directly communicated disease is and learning from that. We have people in the, in the government agencies. There are people like Kay and Bill and others we have heard from here who have, you know, who pay, a, who appreciate good data, good analysis, use those models, and are guided by it. And I think that you can speak to them directly. Um, but at some point, most of my interactions are not with people like that. They are with members of Congress. And I can tell you that when they describe legislation and rulemaking as sausage making, they're being complimentary. The level of discourse changes completely. And the, you know, what they're interested in and how they communicate it um, is very, very different. And this is, you can see this even among um, our own scientific leaders. So um, we heard from several people at NIH about how you know, the terrific work that they're doing and very detailed, you know, good modeling and analysis. But when Francis Collins goes up to Congress um, and he's testifying, um, I can tell you the type of people he cites. He looks at, he cites United for Medical Research, which is a health funding advocacy group. And they give him numbers like the Human Genome Project produced $1 trillion in economic benefit to the country. Now, this begs the question, Craig Venture might say, yes, it did, but I'm, I deserve all the credit for that. But that's what Francis says. And, um, and then he says, from 1970 to 2000, um, just in terms of extended life expectancy, he's contributed 60, what if, $68 trillion or something like that to the economy. And you say, what, what type of number is that? I mean, really? But this, this is our scientific leader I, um, you know, presenting this type of information. If anybody uses a number in a lot of these discussions on the Hill, what gets cited over and over again is appalling. I mean, Robert Solow's 1957 paper is still probably the most use number. And they don't even care what the number is. I mean, because they'll say, well, Robert Solo said 80% of economic growth came in. No, 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 he said 50%. Doesn't matter. Robert Solo said it. He won the Nobel Prize. We need to fund research. 
And that's the level of discussion. If they're really sophisticated, they'll quote Edwin Mansfield's work from the 1970s on the return on investment to federal spending in, in R&D. What Mansfield did was go out and interview a few CEOs and force them to give him a number. He averaged the numbers and went back 28% return on investment. That, that's what passes for analysis among sophisticated members of Congress. <laughs> the, the rest of them don't even want to hear any numbers. This is, um, it's also a problem even dealing with the scientific community, and this is a, a power issue. Um, one of the things that Jack Marburger was trying to get at was that we need a, you know, a more rational, um, evidence-driven um, rationale for the way we make our decisions. The trouble is that since the days of Vannevar Bush, the science community has been reveling in the fact that government thinks they can't make those decisions. We're going to ask members of the National Academy of Sciences to help us make those decisions, because only they can really make good decisions about science. If you start developing methods that allow people who are not expert chemists, biologists, and physicists to make these decisions, you're taking power away from my colleagues here at the National Academy of Sciences who like making these decisions. And they know that if you go to these models, somebody else is going to be able to read those models and make those decisions. And yet, you're trying to get these people to sell that idea to policymakers. It's just a problem. And, um, and, I, can, <laughs> and I can tell you also, you know, when we look at um, when you hear discussions among senior scientists, or the people that hang around here, um, when they look at data and evaluation of science, all they look at is the misuse of age factor and impact ratings and so on. And they're so tired of being at faculty hiring meetings or promotion meetings where nobody has read the papers and everybody says, well, look at the age factor. If that's all you're going to think about. So they're extremely suspicious of this analysis because all they've seen of it is pretty lame, simple-minded use of this data. Um, so you have a real job in explaining to them um, how this works. So all of that is this to um, sort of be an advertisement for the workshop that I'm doing as part of this series, which is how do you tell stories? The poet Muriel Rukeyser said, the world is not composed of atoms, it's composed of stories. And the, the way, what we have to learn in this community is when understanding the audience that we're delivering our analysis to, and in some cases it can be as data driven, you can use all the flow charts, you can produce the types of things we've seen on the screen here. Believe me, if you had put up two of these screens in a row in a congressional hearing, they would have just headed for the door. But if you tell a story, I mean, you talk about women in, in science, and we can look at the data, what they're getting. If you just tell the story of CRISPR Cas9, and when people talk about who's going to get the Nobel Prize, which they're talking about already, and it's Jennifer Doudna, Manuel Charpentier, and Fang Zhang at Harvard, so one male, two women. And then you look at Eric Lander's article about how, look at all the men that have contributed to this, and why isn't George Church on this list, and da 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 da. You're going to get, you're going to see a real story of the male establishment trying to squeeze women out of the running for the Nobel Prize. And that, you can use data to support that. I mean, one of the things that all of the work you're doing um, would be helpful in is that when we tell a narrative, it would be good if the narrative does have a base of evidence. <laughs> um, the, the trouble is that the best narratives sometimes don't. And you know, when we face that, um, you know, perfect example, Norm Augustine, who's been one of the most effective advocates for science in talking to Congress, former corporate executive at Lockheed. And, you know, we have to sort of put a rope around him because he'll cite any research that he sees that he thinks is effective, and it works for him. But the best thing he said to Congress is that, look, if when you're looking at whether or not we should fund research, he says, I'm, I come out of the airplane industry. You're trying to make airplanes more efficient. One way to do it is to reduce weight. You don't do it by throwing out the engine. That tells more than all of the data, all the statistics we have on the contribution. People remember that story. It's good that we have some data to support it. But so anyway, so um, I know everybody's ready to get to lunch. I'm ready to get to lunch. So my sort of challenge to you is to, to think about at lunch and talk about is what happens when you leave this room and you're not talking to kindred spirits? And you're not, not, they're not only not kindred, they're, they're hostile alien species <laughs> whose, whose minds were completely different from yours. But like it or not, they have power. And it's because they tell stories on the campaign trail and they get elected. 
And so I'd like you all to be thinking about how do you translate and deliver the stories, the analysis, the great work you're doing to an audience that speaks a completely different language, but in some ways wants science to be accountable. And we want science to be accountable, but we also want to make it lively, interesting, compelling, and memorable. Thank you. Okay, Kati, do we have time for some discussion? I'm afraid not. Actually, this entire conference is designed in a way that hopefully you get so, so keen and interested and just desperate to talk to each other <laughs> that you actually do. And um, those of you which have been um, check checking emails from time to time, I just sent out the complete email list um, of all the names and all the email addresses so you can connect to each other. So I'm um, sorry for leaving so little time for discussion. I would actually love to hear the discussion, but we have only 40, actually, 40 yeah, minutes left to do two things. One is lunch, and the other one, those of you which signed up to see uh, Philip Beasley's uh, Living Architectures um, tour, please do go with him first and then come back for lunch. In the meantime, however, enjoy talking again uh, with the other people, <laughs> and then please be back here at uh, 12, no, 1.30 for flash talks, so make sure we have all the slides. <laughs>